Okay, so real quick, I'm going to go ahead and start doing some basics in C. We're going to start with variables and assigning data to them. It's just going to be some basic numeral data types, looking at how we can manipulate the data using some basic arithmetic, looking at some operators. Most of them should be familiar. There may be one new one, but hopefully overall everything here is familiar and should be mostly seeing how we implement things that you already know in C. All right, then to look over at the notes, figure things out. Like I said, just basic introduction to variables, doing in the C language, so it shouldn't be too complex. Now, first thing, we have some reserved keywords. These are a collection of words in the C language that you cannot use for your all intents and purposes because it associates them with some behavior already. So if you see anything in red, basically understand that this has been removed. A lot of it's been removed this year in C23. And then some things are blue that might have this like right here with things when they were added. So back in 99, we had some of these things added. Um, here, we're not gonna worry about this too, too much right now. But for now, this, this, and this. So int, float, let me mark this a little better. Yeah, so int, float, double are gonna be important here. Now there's gonna be a lot of other things we're gonna go over with the course, well, of this course, but these three are gonna be pretty important today. You'll see a few other ones, but we'll get to those when we get there. So, where do we start? Well, variables. They're named items that are going to be used to store data in memory. So there's a bunch. You just saw a few on that previous page. And we have four right here. We have integers. We have floats, doubles, and characters. Known as int, float, double, and char. So this format here, we have int var 1, float var 2, double var 3, and char var 4. And you'll notice we have semicolons for the delimiters, but each of these are essentially creating some data in memory, which is your RAM, that we're going to set aside for later. So anytime that you access or try to use var1, so if I want to do, I don't know, int sum equals var1 plus var2 it'll know where this is. It's going to associate in memory wherever the compiler puts it. We don't manually do that. A lot of this is handled by a compiler, so we don't have to worry about specific aspects of memory locations. We'll get to dealing with low-level memory eventually, but that is a good bit later on. So nothing to worry about now. For now, you just initialize these variables with a data type and you're good. So in actually assigning data, so kind of what I just did a moment ago where I did var1 equals something. So this one says int var1 equals 12. That would be assigning, which is essentially going to be taking something. Maybe it'd be this 12, this 7.7 .7 or something here. And saying this is what I want to be stored at that memory location. So if I have this int var1 down here. I can say, okay, I want int var1 to be 12. That's cool. And later on, maybe I want to do var1 equals 15. I can overwrite it, but it's going to be the same location in memory. So this variable has been initialized here with its data type of integer. And then the name is var1. So anytime that I want to reference this variable, I just use the same name and I'm good. If I want to overwrite, I can do that if I want to... I don't know, maybe do int var2 equals var1, do that too. So now var1 is equal to 12, and then if I do int var2 equals var1, that would mean var2 also equals 12. This is a few examples that we can do. Now if we look at the examples I have in the actual code, you'll see those four data types, int, float, double, and char, have some specific data. The one thing is we need to remember to use appropriate data types whenever we are programming. So if I know I need a decimal value, like the 7.7, .7, I can't use integer. We'll touch on that later. 
but it's very important to keep this in mind that certain data types are restricted to what they can account for. So integers specifically are going to be non-decimal values, so they cannot have some decimal point or fraction or anything associated with them. So we're going to use a lot of integers going forward, you're going to see them a lot for the next few slides, so just keep that in mind. So with basic arithmetic, we've already seen an example because I did it a while ago, we can create many types of expressions utilizing the variables and we're known as literals and various operators. So literals are these static numbers, three and six, and you see another one here is two. They're known by a few people, I say a few people, a lot of people call them magic numbers, but essentially a literal is just, we have some constant static number here and it's fine to use them for the most part but it can get a little bit cumbersome to read code that uses these literals if you don't understand the logic behind why they're there so if i were to use i for an example i would have 3.14 and this is fine and all but it's not exactly what you want so there are a few times where you can use literals and it's perfectly fine a lot of time it'd be much better to associate it with a variable like this so that's what we actually use them for not to use static numbers because those are kind of hard to read and interpret why do we care about this number like why this number specific so using decent variable names i know mine are all of our one and whatnot is important you'll see that later on and i'll touch on that in a bit but for now with the arithmetic we have some operators we have addition subtraction multiplication and division in this case, we have int var1 equals 3 plus 6, so var1 would equal 9. We have int var2 equals 2 times var1, Well, we know that var1 is 9, so 2 times 9, so var2 equals 18, and if I have var3, that equals var2, which is 18, divided by var1, which is 9, so var3 is 2. Not too bad. Now, this is going to have some precedent rule, which you would know as the order of operations. And they follow standard order of operations pretty closely, but there's gonna be a few nuances here. I'm gonna touch on So the first one is your basic parentheses. So expressions parentheses are evaluated first. So if you see some like the six times two, that's gonna happen before anything else. We have the unary minus so what this is essentially assume this right here this minus and then parentheses two plus one now we would do the parentheses first but then we essentially are multiplying by negative one here so if we did i'm just gonna do an example here uh six times negative two this would evaluate to six times negative two is negative twelve then we have unary minus so that'd be negative one basically times negative 12, it would be positive 12. So it should be something you've seen in basic algebra, but just kind of breaking down how your compiler is going to see this and how it's going to evaluate and figure things out. Next step would be the multiplication division step that I'm pretty sure most people are familiar with, but we have another thing here. This is not percent. It is a percent sign, as you would be familiar with the actual sign, but it's called modulo. We're going to talk about that later. This is the operator set that most people may not be familiar with, especially if you've never done programming before. But it is very, very helpful in programming. And then finally, we have addition and subtraction. So for a lot of these things, let's just go ahead and work through a few of these. We have unary minus 3, so negative 3 basically, plus 6, so it's going to be 3. 2 times 8 plus 5, multiplication comes first, 2 times 8 is 16, plus 5 is going to be 21. We have parentheses, so 2 plus 9 is 11, times 3 is going to be 33. Uh, we have 6 times 2, that's going to be 12. 2 plus 1 is 3. Unary, 12 divided by negative 3 is negative 4. We have a more cumbersome ones here. We have 2 times, in parentheses, expression unary minus, more parentheses, 6 divided by 3, which I'm going to those. 2. 
plus four. And this is a unary two. That's negative two plus four. Be positive two in these parentheses times two, so that should be four. And then we have six minus two here in these parentheses. Again, the more the parentheses get nested, you're doing left to right. So if there is parentheses inside of parentheses, well, those are going to be evaluated first. So you'll notice they kind of follow a certain pattern. So six minus two is going to be four plus three is going to be seven. Right. That's this parenthesis with this parenthesis. That's unary. Negative seven minus seven negative 14. Now, hopefully those are all correct. I didn't mess up, but if it did, you can follow it along just fine. But essentially, we have some order of operations and it should operate the same way that you expect it to in basic algebra. Now, with being said, if you're writing it out, then just like basic algebra, it's very likely that you might make a mistake when writing it out. So always test and be sure. On that note, as you're writing code, please, please make sure that you test as you write. Don't write a lot of code and then expect it to run fine later. It is very, very common to make some basic mistake. Maybe you put minus when you meant to say plus. Maybe you did. Maybe you missed parentheses. Maybe you misplaced the parentheses. So it's it's very common that some basic arbitrary mistake may have happened. Maybe use a different variable when you didn't mean to. You miss a semicolon. So there's a lot of mistakes that can happen and doing nested arithmetic is one of those common places where mistakes might happen. So just as you're writing code, when you get done with certain aspects of it, please test it. I beg you. Anyway, floating point data. Everything we've seen so far that we've been dealing with in the past few slides has been integers. So no decimal values at all. We can have negative integers, we can have positive, we can have zero, no big deal. But when it comes to floating point, integers cannot have a decimal value. There are reasons for that, because you lose precision and accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. But for now, let's look at two different floating point types. We have floats and we have doubles. Now. You'll notice here that on my examples, I have two floats, I have two doubles. So you have 3.14, which is just standard uh, truncated to two decimal points. Hi, the significant distance are not that large. And we have 2.0, which is just two, but it has the actual uh, point zero aspect, not a big deal. And we have 9,347.323. And then you have 0, 0.0. Now, let's pay attention to this one and this one in particular, because I wrote them for a specific reason. I mean, the two can do it, but floats are much smaller than doubles. They could be used interchangeably at lower numbers, like this 0, 0.0 here. But the reason I wrote the very large 9,000 plus number is to specify that whenever you're using double, it takes up more space and memory because it can hold much larger numbers. We'll touch about that and why that is later on. But just know that doubles, you'll see them used sparingly in introductory courses like this. But when you're actually doing any actual programming, if it comes to being memory efficient, if you can get away with using a float, you should because it is genuinely more efficient than using a double. It is going to be easier to use doubles because they cover a lot of bases. It doesn't matter how big the data is. You don't have to be very particular and nuanced with, well, I might overflow the value that a float can hold. Double handle basically everything you could possibly throw at it. So that's why you see them used pretty frequently in these introductory courses because they're safer to use in terms of having inaccurate data. But in terms of efficiency, floats are going to be better if you can use them. So again, I'll touch on that later on. Let's go ahead and move on right now. All right. 
So scientific notation, we can do that pretty easily and C as well. And it's very, very helpful because when it comes to floating point, a lot of the time you're going to get very large or very, very small data. You have a lot of decimals and you don't want to deal with it. So what we can do is do the standard, let's say 0 0.0001, doing one times 10 to the negative five, which is something you might be familiar with, or we can shorthand that to one E negative five. So same thing, if we have one million, that's the same thing as saying one times 10 to the sixth or one E six. So for floats and doubles the same way, this would be 5.65 e to the 12 which would be the same thing as 5.65 times 10 to the 12 and 4.2 times 10 to the negative 14 so on and so forth and you'll notice this is a little bit more accurate to what i was talking about these floats here yes multiplying anything times 10 to the 12 10 to the negative 14 that's going to be very very large or very very small data however it's going to pale in comparison to times 10 to the 34 or negative 24. So we, we definitely want to use doubles when it comes to these very large or very small constants. And again, I'll touch more on the specific reason why soon. Not this video, but soon. Now, the next two slides are gonna be more on how we deal with division and that modulo operator we talked about and this is going to be specifically integer division because like i said integers cannot hold any floating point data so if you have a decimal or fraction it will be dropped it's going to be truncated completely so this example of int x equals 5 divided by 2 when we solve that yeah that should be 2.5 however it's an integer of x that 0.5 is going to go away and you're just going to get 2. Over here you have, say, int my budget, that's how much money I have, uh, maybe $1,274 to spend. And I need to buy something, and I need to buy multiple of them. So the price of it is going to be 128 So what I would do, the amount that I can purchase, is my budget divided by item price. Well, that would have some floating point aspect to it. But we can't buy a fraction of an item. So doing inner division here is fine. That just means I can buy nine of these, because nine times 128 is not going to go over 1,274, but if we did times 10, then it would, so we couldn't buy it. So, energy division has a lot of benefits occasionally, especially if you want to say, how many times can I go into something? I don't care about the actual floating point data. It doesn't matter, like, if I had... Well, I mean, this is actually a good example. I'm not going for the one I was going to go for because you could use floating point. Disregard that. But basically, if you need the remainder, at least the, the decimal aspect of division, then do not use integers. You would want to use floats or doubles. But if you don't need that, then just know that integer division will immediately drop the decimal floating point aspect for you just by the nature of how it works. Now, when you're dealing with integers and you don't care about how many you can have in the win, you want to know the remainder, that is where the modulo operator comes in play. So it's similar to division, but instead of getting the actual division value, so the uh, quotient, you are going to get the remaining data. So if we did that same example, int x equals five modulo two, the modulus, which is the result, is going to be 1. So we have 5 divided by 2. Let me 2. And then 2 times 2 is 4. 5 minus 4 is 1. Oh, not me too bad. So, one really cool aspect of modulus, and I, I say really cool, this is me just like math and different things it's going to tie into a program we do eventually but if you need to determine whether a number can be divided into another number like an example of 2 being 12 to being divisible by 2 or an example of that would be if something is bi not binary even or odd 
you can use a modulo operator for that very easily. So if we look at this, 12 modulo 2 is going to be 0 because, well, that's divisible. 7 not divisible by 2, so we're going to get 1 as a remainder. And we get 10 is divisible by 5, so that should be 0 because if we can 5 can go into 10, there's no remainder. Good to go. And so if we want to have something even or odd, if it can be divided by 2 and have no remainder, it's even. So if I did, say, I don't know, 586,931, I want to determine, hey, is this even or odd? Well, I just do modulus 2. I'm going to determine, oh, well, I don't have the remainder, so nope. This is not even. This is odd. And the moment I do, I don't know, 40. Yep, that is going to have a modulus of zero. So I can determine that, yep, that is even. So that's one pretty cool aspect of modulo and where it can come into play. Now, finally, we have the idea of constant variables. And this is something that is going to be quite niche, but very helpful if you want to do, I don't want to say proper programming because there's technically no wrong way to program, but when it comes to making it easier for others to interact with what you've written, or maybe even keeping yourself in check when you're writing code, or come back to the code that you've written, then having, again, proper names for your variables is always helpful. But if you need values, like the literals that we were talking about earlier, it's not exactly good to have a bunch of literals in code because if you come back to your code or somebody else reads your code and you have, oh, something times 17, what is the 17? So you have to ask, somebody has to ask the question of, well, what's the 17 here for? What does it represent? Why, why is it important? Then you have to explain it. Or maybe you come back to your code and you see 17 as like, why is this here? What was I using it for? Well, that could be very easily solved by having int, I'm just gonna name it bar. I don't know why you'd have something just randomly 17. Oh, maybe you had Taxes is always a good aspect. So maybe you have, I don't know. Let's just say you have taxes like 10 cents. So you're gonna need the value of 10. So you would want int tax 10. You know that this tends to be associated with taxes in some way and you don't have to explain it. It's there, it's written by an actual name, but maybe you actually change it for whatever reason. I don't know why you would change it, but maybe you actually change it. Maybe you hand off the code to somebody else and they change it. It was never meant to be changed. It was meant to be a static value and you do not want it to be changed. Well, that is where the idea of constant variable comes into play because once you initialize a constant variable, just by adding this const here, then it cannot be changed. So this is a way to reduce the amount of literals that are in your code and also have it well-defined, well-named, and then indicate this value should not change. So examples I have here are const double pi equals 3.14. So pi can't be changed, it never should be changed. So I have it as a constant, but I don't want to just write 3.14 every single time when I use pi. So, because I had to explain like what is this value for, but it's pi, so most people will know. But if you had something like Euler's number or Avogadro's number, or something like that, you would want to set up some constant value indicating that this data should not change throughout the program. Same thing here as the acceleration due to gravity is being a constant value of negative 9.8. We want this value to not change at any point during the program. And instead of just writing the value negative 9.8 during this course, then you would 
not want to actually use literals it's, again it's okay to use literals sparingly but if you just start writing a bunch of again what they're called magic numbers then people have to interpret what is this value for why is it relevant can it be altered should it be altered and it be solved very easily by having decent variable names and making sure that if it doesn't need to change make it a constant and that's basically what these are used for so that's all i have for the basic introduction of variables so whenever some basic types basically integers floats doubles look chars touch more on that in the next video though and then looked at the basic order of operations with parentheses you know minus which is like negative one multiplication division and then addition uh, subtraction and also looked at modulos so if you aren't familiar with that operation it exists it has a lot of uses very very helpful especially in programming that's why i say if you're never programmed before you may never have seen it but if you have that's awesome so hopefully all this made sense hope you learned something i'll see you next video